Hello, everyone. This is Paul Casey from the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame. This is our educational video series where we ask our Hall of Fame members to come online with us, spend a quality time discussing principles of Kempo, motion, uh, Kempo past, present, their visions for the future. And today we're really honored, truly honored, to have a master of the arts all the way from Ireland, one of my favorite people in the world, Mr. Ed Downey. Master Downey, welcome to the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame. How are you, sir? I'm feeling great this evening. It's good to talk to you, Paul. Well, we are going to ask you lots and lots of questions. So you're the first guy up on this. We're going to talk some things. So, you know, before we go any further, I would love to have you tell us a little bit about your history, uh, Ed, so that we can get a little more background on you. Well, I started with John Conway back in 1973. In, in the club in Ireland, which is called Fitzwilliam Street. So it was a pretty famous club. And then I went on to train with another instructor called Morris Mann. And he was another really good Irish instructor. And then um, in the late 70s, I got to connect with Mr. Parker and then was basically training with Mr. Parker until he, his passing and then moved on. And from over 13 years now with Mr. Sepulveda. Let me say, let's go back a little bit. So you started off your Kempo journey in Dublin, Ireland. Yes. Okay, and at, you know, at the first school, was that, who originally created that, uh, that school? Well, it was, um, it, John, uh, it was John Conway's school with uh, Jim Royce. So that was John Conway's school, but he had been a student of John McSweeney. So um, we, 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 we knew John McSweeney, but John Conway was my first instructor. Can you give us a little bit of background of, you know, what it was like to train in Ireland those days? Well, it was like, you know, it was the Bruce Lee era. It was, the, the, you, when I, when I first went Mr. Conway's club, I knocked at the door and it was like, it was like the scene out of the Enter the Dragon. It was just full of young men. We had no children, no women. Everyone was really 18 to about 25 years old. And interestingly, it was just tough and rough and, it was, um, it was a great experience. In fact, when I knocked at the door to join the club, he told me to come back in two weeks. He was just too busy. And so ah. it, was a, it was, it was a, so popular. It was, but it was the only place to be. It was, um, it, we, were, we, ruled, we ruled Dublin at that time. Dublin was, Kempo, Kempo was, the, the, was the dominant martial art and still is one of the dom dominant martial arts in Ireland. Was it like a scene out of The Quiet Man? The Quiet Man is, uh, <laughs> well, uh, you, you, we, I brought Bob White down to where it was made, and um, we love John Wayne. John Wayne is somebody we love a lot. You know, so, um, well, I was referring we, to the fight scene. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, we, I mean, we, 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 like to hit our, we like to hit hard in Ireland. We, I think of a, I have an unfair reputation for hitting hard. Um, really? So. <laughs> no kidding. So you're training in, in Dublin and you're studying under John Conway. Give us yeah. an insight uh, to uh, Master Conway. I mean, well, his background was he had been, he, wor he used to work in the docks in, in Ireland. So that was a tough, tough time. So he was a hard man and he, and he, he, he was strong. He, his classes were, you know, anything he ever taught me, I never forgot because he was just powerful. I mean, he, he, the, the, the Kempo was just, I suppose, you know, you, we didn't, you know, we, we, we never heard of waivers until we arrived in America. I mean, we, we were, the techniques were strong, we fought a lot. Um, and in those days, we fought, we fought competitions against the, the Japanese and whatever. But, I mean, the, we had no gloves on. It was, and we, we were matching these guys. We were, it was an interesting time. Um, it was so it was so popular it was unbelievable i mean the classes were you could have 60 guys in a class i mean the atmosphere was just i mean it was like i don't know if you like being in a rugby match and then you walk out you got your shins were buckled your knuckles were raw but it was it was fun it was inter it was definitely a different era and uh, i i in i'll send you some pictures maybe and you can see it was a picture of, of our one of our clubs and everyone in the club has got long hair down to their shoulders. And in that area, you either had the skinhead or you had long hair. And, and the guys in our club, we had all long hair. We oh, were, so you were, you were a long hair kind of guy, huh? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, we had a lot of hair. Yeah, clutching feathers had meant something to us, for sure. 
<laughs> so you're trained. So tell us the first day you walked into the school and your first lesson. Well, it was, it was a, actually the format was very similar to what you were probably used to because we had, we had private lessons and we had group lessons, which is, was unusual because later on in Ireland, it was mostly group lessons. So Mr. Conway would um, run, run the lesson. We had all the program charts. It was the 32 technique format. So we had 32 techniques per belt, which was, um, it was a challenge. It was a, that was a lot of stuff to remember, but it was interesting. And we were, we were learning intellectual departure and you know, aggressive twins, those type of techniques. And then the next, that was in 1973. And then in 74, Mr. Parker arrived in Ireland. He came over. And if you, he had been funded by Elvis to bring over a team to, to Belgium, to fight the Belgians. And then John Conway brought Mr. Parker into Ireland. So um, uh, Tom Kelly was with him. And, um, but anyway, we got a bit, everything was shook up a little bit. So we moved over, we, we stopped doing the 32 techniques. We went to the 24 techniques. And then we, uh, intellectual departure was dropped and we moved on to deflecting hammer. And uh, Mr. Parker kind of did you know, a couple of dinner dances, and we had um, he had a television. I think he was on the television appearance as well. So it was pretty, um, pretty spectacular. Yeah, it was did you make? Incredible. Did you? Were you ever participating in any of those appearances? Like, were you involved with the demo or? Yeah, what? there's some footage. There's tele We have some Irish television footage where I was. Uh, we did a demo with Mr. Parker, and I tried. I because I was organizing a, a, a lot of his trips and airfares and hotels i tried to do a lot i overdid it i i had him on i had him on a radio show then they went on a television show and then after the television show i had arranged for um a dinner dance it was like a dance and like he was going to come in and we had some awards and whatever but the the television host it was like your equivalent of the late late show and uh, it was a called late late show here very famous uh, presenter but what happened was there was another guest coming on afterwards and he asked Mr. Parker to stay on for another hour on the TV show. And it really messed up our plans because we had, we, we had another event organized with about 300 people in a big hotel for, for, and he was a guest of honor, but he was still on, we had a big screen at the dinner dance and they were watching the live, tele, it was live television. But the next guest that followed was a dating specialist. And, and she was like, how do you make how do you make a pass at somebody and and Le Leanne was in the audience and and he Ed, Ed, Ed Parker was kind of was the guest kept saying well how would you how would you interact with this lady and how would you talk and it was kind of an odd thing but we I have all that footage which would be probably interesting to people you know wow. and the host was um was a little bit of this he said to Mr Parker he says uh, if you don't mind me saying so you're quite a big man you know like you like for an athlete and uh, Mr. Parker's answer was that uh, he was a victim of his taste buds. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so was, I got a question. So let's move on. So you're training there in, in Dublin. You're at the school. Uh, the name of the school, if I have it correct here, was the uh, Fitzwilliam Street Kempo Academy, correct? Yes, yeah. Okay. So you're training there. How much time did you spend on, say, basics versus uh, techniques versus um, – Oh, I don't know. Uh, freestyle. I think we did pretty much, pretty much even on everything. We liked to fight. I mean, we 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 all liked to fight. It was um, it was funny. I, I would say I fought I fought a lot. I won the All All Ireland Championships a few times, and the the difference was that it was just in my from for me personally, fighting is not a problem. I enjoy. I always enjoy fighting. And so it was pretty much a big, big part. The basics were strong, forms, um, techniques. I mean, we kind of did everything. We, we ran everything. Which William Street, though, has a club, was quite small. Um, it, was, like it was a private kind of, the basement of a private house. So later on, we, we, was a, we were training in another club, which was only 200 yards away. But they had a big, like a community sports hall. And that gave us a lot more space. But has a club, which William Street was a, was a, was a home basically originally like a it was a we call a Georgian building so it was about three four hundred years old and um, 
a lot of good history there. A lot of, we were very, um, uh, but, but not very spacious, not very spacious. I understand. Obviously, you've talked about spending a lot of time fighting inside the club. I'm guessing controlled sparring. Um, maybe not. <laughs> oh, is that between the pints or what? <laughs> well, you see, <laughs> the problem we had was we started off fighting, we just fought, right? And uh, anyway, the, we, we, the, this crowd came in and said, we're going to have full contact fights. So we said, um, full contact, what's that like? And they came out with a lot of big gloves and they were showing what they were doing. And I said, oh my God, I said, if that's full contact, what in God's name have we been doing for the last, you know, you know, 20 years, 30 years? Because we were murdering each other. And what they were describing as full contact and showing us was very mellow compared to what we were doing. We were, we were whacking each other. Um, we, I mean, one of the guys that came in and he got a f first foam he head guard. And we, as soon as we seen the head guard, we started hitting him hard because we thought that he has protection. And that head guard came up so fast. He just realized, we thought he was protected in reality. So um, it, it wasn't really a definition. There was really you fought. That was it. Mm. And then point fighting came in and the, we had issues with the Japanese instructors because they didn't like front kicks. They didn't like front hand strikes. And it took a long time for them actually to be accepted. I think really Ed Parker's Long Beach kind of sorted that out. We, you know, with people like Steve Sanders and probably Bob White and Frank Trejo start, you know, start showing that front hand kicks and point front hand strikes did work. But initially, the, the, we had difficulty with the Japanese stylists. They weren't really accepting that those type of weapons. Let's go back to your fight. And so a, a lot of in school competition, you know, competing with each other, sparring, training, as you, when did you decide or when did the school decide to go into tournament competition? They started to organize, there's a place called the Mansion House in, in Ireland, which is where the Lord Mayor is, and that they started to organize competitions. So we, but we had to fly it under Japanese rules. So they brought in these um, Japanese based instructors and told us the rules. You can, you know, this is what you do and whatever. And we started fighting. And um, it was like, for instance, like we had like five, there were five man teams. So one, one instance where the Kempo team comes out and at that point, black belts were rare. So we had five brown belts. We had like a national team and I was one of the team. So we bowed in and we were fighting, say, a Wadaroo, Wadaroo team. The Wadaroo guy knocks out the Kempo guy, right? The next fight, the Kempo guy knocks out the Wadaroo guy. So then I'm the third fighter. And technically, it's my turn to get knocked out, except I'm not going to get knocked out. So I knock out, I break the sequence and I knock out the Wadaroo guy. But they just took them off in stretchers. They just, uh, it just, uh, <laughs> just the way it was. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Stretchers and carried them over to the pub, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I keep on uh, referring to that because anybody that's ever, ever been to Europe, spent any time in, in Ireland or England and even Germany, they spent a lot of time in pubs. I got to tell you, folks, they enjoy yeah, the, the their adult beverages. In, the pubs in Ireland are, they're more um, like, five-star hotels in terms of the fit out you oh, you're really? a lot of a lot of your pubs in in the u.s are a, bit, a little bit sleazy i think you know pub, yes it, it depends on the, where it is though it depends yeah, yeah yeah we we have a good irish pub is well fitted out and very comfortable yeah. yes indeed so okay so you're going up the ranks you're you're competing in tournaments uh when did you come to america to compete at the uh in any american tournaments is specifically maybe the IKC, International Cry Championship. IKC Champions. was the er, er, early 80s. Early, early 80s. 80s. Yeah, yeah. Early yeah, 80s. About, yeah, yeah. So, and then for, for mostly about 10 years. But the, the problem we found, what I found with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the internationals was, is that we really probably needed to do what, what, what Mr. Conway did when he moved over, is that we probably needed to base ourselves for a few weeks and get good coaching or whatever. We came over with a lot of heart and did quite well. We got, you know, quarterfinals, semifinals, one or two of our students won, we took first place. But really, the, we didn't have a circuit in Europe. I mean, from what we could see, you had a pretty decent tournament every weekend. We, we'd have maybe two tournaments a year. So we weren't getting the match time 
to, to really to be the develop ourselves the way we need it to be, which is different now. Now when we go to tournaments, we kind of do pretty decent because we have the we have the the biggest tournament, the biggest martial arts tournament in the world is in Ireland. You know, we have a competition called the Irish Open, and there's a they limit they limit the entries. They 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 only they limit it to four thousand competitors. Four thousand so, competitors. Yeah. Wow. And it, yeah, and then they cut it off. They, they cut it off at four thousand. So, is there an equal representation of different styles? It's it's multi style. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but it's 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 a it's a cut off point of four thousand. So it's the biggest tournament in the world. So nowadays we have the opportunity to our my students can compete at you know that level. In the, but in the old days we didn't have it. You know because we um, gradually it, it developed. But I mean, trying to get to the U.S. was um, it was going to cost you to get to the U.S. And in the early days, a lot of my friends, I think they bought second homes and and made some good investments. And my investment was travel to see Mr. Parker and go to Long Beach. How often did you compete at the IKC? Every year, and for the during the eighties. Yeah. And which which divisions did you compete in? Um, I was a black belt from eighty one, so it was always black belt. Yeah, it was always black belt. Tell us about your black belt test. Um, it was interesting. Uh, the, I mean, the forms went. I was happy with techniques. I was happy with. They, they had a system in those days where they, they liked it. You had an uki and you work your techniques on the uki. And in general, that was fine. Except I had to change my my uki three times because I was kind of excited, and. Um, then we also had to, you know, we did a lot of fighting at the end. But in the two man, in the two man matches where they come out two, two against you, I mean, I I decided I could see what was happening to other people. I mean, they were being wiped out. So I decided that was, you know, it's I know you're probably the same. We got my retaliation in first. So the guy when they were going to go for me, I decided to go for them before they got me. So I was I was quite happy. I came through. I came through pretty good. You know, How long was the test? Probably two and a half hours, probably thereabouts. Yeah, I mean, when I hear, when I hear long tests, and some remember some guys telling me like four or five hours, I said, "What? You can't do a test." I mean, two and a half. Obviously, numbers do dictate tests, but two and a half, three hours is what we what we normally would have. Yeah, that would be, and that's that's because it would be in a few people testing. Do you remember who was on the board at that time? Uh, would have been mostly the Irish guys. Um, I tested for my second degree and third degree with Mr. Parker, but for my first degree, it was the Irish black belts like Morris Mann, John Conway, those lads. My sec second and third degree were with Mr. Parker, but my first degree was in Ireland because I hadn't, uh, we, they were my instructors. You, you know, at this point in your, in your teaching, you're obviously very proficient in, um, you know, the advanced Kempo karate system, but you were coming up in, in Ireland. Can you tell us what was the differences that you've learned between what you initially were taught in Ireland and then later what was brought over from America? Okay. So I, because I started with Mr. Conway, Mr. Conway's Kempo was pretty much on par with um, what, you, what was happening in America. Um, but we also trained with Morris Mann and his Kempo was, was was kind of similar to the earlier Kempo that was that Mr. McSweeney was teaching. So I kind of had an overview of what of the kind of earlier earlier to the 1950s Kempo and then the Kempo that came out in the mid 60s. So um, it's it, I suppose it, being able to ask a question and get a good answer was interesting. Um, I mean, when we we trained, we didn't have the internet, didn't have video, so. If you wanted to learn, you had to go somewhere and get someone to teach you. So I think that made a difference for me because having to physically learn something from somebody because we didn't have videos, we didn't have internet. So you had to learn physically, you know, mm -hmm. which I think helped a lot. I think a lot of people maybe nowadays, you know, their first lesson might be, might be the video and then eventually somebody might physically critique them. But maybe a lot of times people probably learn via the video first. So I think it was the physical interaction that I liked a lot. You know, it's funny is that we're talking about modern technology here. I'm, I'm in Las Vegas. You're there in Ireland and we're 
able to communicate, exchange ideas, talk about experiences and whatnot. Is this the future of Campo? I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. I think, I mean, I've seen technology where I know, like, I know where you, in Australia, they have some, they, in different cities, have a surgeon where they operate a machine on a person in another city, maybe eye surgery or something, and the surgeon is operating from a different city. So maybe if I can put on a, a, a suit like a, and, a, and, and you can do long four and my body mimics your four, long four movement, maybe that would be the way to go. I think, I mean, you know, from a, you can get, achieve a lot via Zoom and that, but I think the physical thing, you know, at, you know, the Zena Kempo, the feel is to believe, you know, you know, so we can achieve a lot with technology. The hands you have to be hands have to touch body. That's what I think has to happen. Well, I would prefer to do the online campo than having online eye surgery. For some reason, I feel a little safer. <laughs> 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 Sorry, guys. Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't make sense to yeah. me. I think that's one time. Okay, so let's. You're a student. You've been training with several instructors, including Mr. Parker, until his death. What was the best lessons that you learned from these individuals well mr parker where i learned from when i when i traveled around with him and he was teaching seminars a lot of times people would say mr parker will you teach me this will you teach me they asked him for different techniques different forms etc and i could see the way he was interacting with them and what i learned was when he would say to me at the start of a seminar edward what would you like me to teach and i said whatever you think i need mr parker and, uh, you know, when I, when he went, when he was teaching a seminar, he'd come over to me and he'd say, what do you think? How many do you, how many, how many do you see? And what he meant was a lot of people turned up for pictures and for, for you know, photographs and just to, just to be there, get a stand beside him, say they, they were in a room with him. But he was interested in people who were genuinely wanted to understand what he was teaching. And a lot of people would go up to him and say, hey, this is the way you do this technique, isn't it? And he, his answer was, yeah, sure, you can do that. And rather than go up and say, Mr. Parker, um, this technique, I'm not too sure how to do it. What would you like me to do? But a lot of times people were telling him, and rather than accept it and then try to correct them, if, if they weren't willing to ask the question correctly, that was something that he did. So often the case is, um, I think people need to be open-minded to, to, to go in and be willing to have an open mind to listen. So with Mr. Um, when I went to train with Mr. Sepulveda, I said, I want to start from the beginning again. You know, when I went to Mr. Mr. Conway, everything Mr. Conway taught me, it, it, it's never, it's been, it was always, it, it, it never left me because it, the, the teaching methodology, he was such a good teacher. So I think from my perspective, I've always tried to have a teacher and I never tried to be self, um, self sort of self teaching as such i needed someone to be saying you need to work on this you need to you need to go and improve and i made sure that i had every 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 eight to twelve weeks i either had ed i had that ed parker was either in ireland or i was with him in the us so i would see him over about four times a year maybe for two weeks at a time so i and then when mr sepulveda when i went to him same thing Bob White comes to Ireland twice a year. Mr. Sepulveda comes twice a year. I go to the US twice a year. So I see my teachers and my influencers six, seven times a year. And this is something I've been doing nearly, not quite, about 47 years now. So I had a, I realized from the beginning was I could either, you know, set a level where I was happy with, or I could keep striving to improve my, my knowledge. And that's where I feel I have so much, I think I've so much to learn of so many people and whatever I currently know, I know that I can I almost certainly improve it. So I want to learn more. And I want to grow more. When you're te you're learning from these instructors and you're learning principles and concepts and they're teaching you how, and they, I'm asking, I'm guessing you're also asking questions. Why, what did you learn from that? What have you incorporated into your teaching for your students from the teachers that you studied with? 
I think you need initially to have your own filter system. So you're, you've got all these influencers, from Ed Parker, John Sepulveda, the Bob White, John Conway. You need a system of bringing the information into yourself, filtering it in and having, you probably really have how your tempo is gonna fit because you're an individual, you've got different skills, different talents, different abilities. So you need to be able to filter it, particularly if you're a teacher because then you've got to disseminate it to everybody else. So you've got to pass it out and give it out. So my, one of my clear insights has been looking at techniques in particular was the definition of attacks like when I see some different types of attack and um, different you know punches kicks grabs or whatever there isn't I remember seeing a video on YouTube where a guy was doing long kimono and he grabbed a guy anchored the elbow pulled the guy tight and I said okay and then he said now you do long kimono of course long kimono was impossible because the lock was the arm was anchored the, it was never going to happen so there are the different processes of an attack. So if you've got 30 or 40 punch techniques, the punch techniques are different levels of penetration, different levels of timing, different levels, different angles of execution. Every grab is like, you can have a grab in the reaching process, the grab in the locking process, the pulling process. A lot of times I see people, you know, when the technique might be a grab, they do a push. And so really the definition, you know, the, the, how do you, you know, how get the right context when you're training so that, you know, whether it's sparring or forms, you know, make sure you understand something. And if you just repeat something because visually that's what it should look like, it's kind of zombie training. You don't want to go like that. You want to be, you really want to be, you know, conscious and, and train in an open way. So do you teach it the the technique, do you, how do you term and, uh, qualify the terms? Uh, some people call it the ideal phase. Some people call it the base move. Do you teach the equation formula? How do you help the student to understand that there is so many variables when it comes to uh, these problems? I would think they're work problems in, in one's journey. I think people, is, it, 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 well, if you don't have a concept of how the system operates, you can't really, you know, it's difficult to teach because you're, you're teaching it, you know, you, every technique has a couple of things. It has, it's engineered, so it does an engineering. So the engineering might be, well, what's the, what's the power source in it? Sometimes it's marriage of gravity, you know, sometimes it's rotational torque, sometimes it's backup mass. And all elements will be there, but sometimes there's a more dominant um, power source in it. And then, then there's a tactic. Well, what's the tactic? I mean, what's the dominant tactic in the technique? And what are you trying to achieve? And then if it's, you know, and then if you go to what ifs and whatever there, I mean, the formulation equation is interesting. I mean, that if, you know, it, it, well, can some prefix, of course they can. Can they suffix? Can, can they insert? Can they delete? Can they regulate? Can they, can they alter? Can they rearrange? They can do all those type of things. That's all possible. But that's the language of Kempo. The difficulty is a lot of instructors have verbal diarrhea in that they, 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 uh, they quote terminology, but they don't, it doesn't manifest in, what, in their movement or, or their application. And sometimes it's like saying a very elaborate wording or, a, or maybe a word in another language, but it doesn't translate to application. So there needs to be, um, it needs to be a clear relationship so if you've got the universal pattern in front of you and you're teaching a technique you know you need to know if you're doing a technique say for instance like shielding hammer well you know there's some nice theories ed parker put together like maybe the concept of rip the rag so when you use that kind of concept you can explain that technique pretty well and then you have reference techniques where some techniques you know people talk about family grouping techniques and people call but master key techniques. They're all just useful tools of link. Sometimes a master key technique is really just the basic under engineering is similar. That's all it is. It's similar engineering. It doesn't have the whole tactic of a technique could be totally different and context could be totally different. So, you know, that's, you need to know all that type of material.
Do you use any references of Mr. Parker's writings? Usually we're just constantly quoting. I mean, you're usually, I mean, a lot of times it's the, the, the quotes a lot, you know, like, um, I mean, constantly it's a big, you know, I usually go like to the, you know, go to the students, big circle, and then they come back has to be, you know, big trouble, you know. So you usually have the, you have the terminology and you're looking for the feedback and your expectation is as they evolve through the lower belts and into brown and black belt, that they have this comprehension. Because the, 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 the Zen Kempo, I remember Mr. Parker talking about it, when he was bringing out the Infinite Insights, every year I go to Long Beach, he'd show me another book. And when, when he brought out the fifth one, the, he came over to me, he ran, he ran, came over to look, Edward, number five, it's, I did it for you. And he said, look, it's green for you. I made it green for you. And I, and I kind of laughed at him and said, I don't know if he, he was quite, he was a very smart man and opportunist. Now, I hope he did make the book green for me, you know. Um, but then again, he could also have gone to the Mexicans and said, there's green in your flag and here's gone, whatever. But it was a nice thing for him to say that he made it book five green for Ireland. So well, he had used already four other colors, so he had to come up with something. Yeah, 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 he couldn't <laughs> go wrong. Well, he, he, um, he republished Kempo Karate, you know, Kempo Karate Law of the Fist. Yes, sir. And he, re he republished that book. And I was reading the back of the book and it was like the description of Kempo. And I said, that seems familiar. And Mr. Parker said to me, he said, it should be. I took, I took that from your Black Belt thesis. So he took, I had written a definition of Kempo, what I thought Kempo was. And he took my definition of Kempo and used it on the back of his book to, to explain Kempo. So, so for Ed Parker to say he, he took my definition of Kempo and used it in his, in, on the back of his book, I mean, I felt at least I had a he liked my comprehension of Kempo. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, you were referencing some of these publications here, um, like Infinite Insights Volume 1. Do you, how far do you explore on the eight considerations? Well, that was my black belt thesis. So you explained <laughs> that depth, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, I, I, I miss the Parker. I have a, he, he wrote a nice um, qualification. He was very, he was very, very impressed with my thesis. I did my eight, the eight considerations as my black belt thesis. Okay. So uh, he was very impressed with that. I mean, look, I mean, range, environment, I mean, they're all the things that we have to, I mean, I mean, Ed Parker did, you know, he analyzed everything in such a great way. You know, I mean, his presentation and how he did it. I mean, I think, I don't, I don't, I don't think people realized the level of, of detail that he had. I mean, we look at modern coaching. I mean, I don't think even modern, any of the modern coaches have come near uh, in terms of an, analyzing movement and accept, and, and application the way he had done it. I mean, well, Mr. Parker really, liked to use the analogy uh, examples of the iron worker and the watchmaker. And obviously yeah. he could walk in both camps and easily segue between the two. You had mentioned the internet use of it. What do you find troubling or helpful with the internet? Well, like, like everything on the internet, there's some excellent people out there. I think probably... Um, probably be a nice way if people, I suppose, mostly put on a demonstration, maybe some techniques. Maybe it'd be nice if people did, hey, hey, look, I can do this technique, and then here's, here I'm fighting somebody as well. And hey, hey, look at my, here, they maybe lock into a horse stance and show some good blocks and punches, and maybe go into a good neutral stance and show, show, go through four or five nice kicks. So, so maybe a lot of time it's a showcase where maybe people might be impressed, well, look at this excellent back kick. Like, look at this excellent roundhouse kick. Look at this excellent, you know, maybe demonstration of good basics. Um, so the other thing I suppose is, is the, um, the, you know, internet is interesting in the sense that it has certainly popularized, given more people the opportunity to see Kempo. Um, but I still think um, I, run a, I run a camp every, every, every year. Um, 
and we have some of the we have a lot of really good teachers over but it gives us the opportunity where our black belt class is usually over 100 black belts in the class and we can train a lot and we bring people in from all over europe we have like we have denmark and germany and holland and belgium and italy and spain and portugal you know obviously ireland and the us and you know i think with a, people's future might be a combination of using video because it is certainly a, a good tool and then maybe attending one or two of these bigger events where you can get out mix with a lot of people and you know really challenge your skill set because it's like playing a football game but you never play against another team you know the video is fine i often the analogy i i used to tell my students was when we were going to long beach we would be like you're racing again you're going to go into a race and you don't know how fast the other guy is and it, it is a bit risky that you can you think you have a skill set but when you get into a technique line or a fight and you realize your timing your power and then the simple thing is impact can you are you able to absorb a hit ride a hit avoid a hit you know and um you know in rugby they have a term called are, are you windy you get hit once can you handle it so a lot of times there's a certain things that you know being physical will will help will help out on you but yeah i think there's a good mix of videos are useful but they have to be combined with with the physical interaction so you've just what we've discussing then is been about the physical application and and how it involves the student how do you deal with the mindset for the students so that they'll be properly prepared I think with mindset is, you know, obviously every, everyone's got different psychological profiles. I mean, some people are relatively passive, some people are aggressive, you know, so you need to, you need to nurture people. You need to bring sometimes, I mean, let's face it, a um, good friend of mine, Lee Wedlick said, you know, we don't teach karate, we teach people. So a lot of times as a good teacher, your student walks in and you get a sense of after maybe one class, two classes, you get a sense of the personality. You know, maybe if someone's really over aggressive, you might want to tone it down and teach them some self control. If someone's pretty passive, you want to learn how to build up their spirit so they have good application. You might want to work some pad work or maybe strike shield work to get teaching how to good 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 definition in their weapons. Um, and then it, when it eventually becomes maybe the, the technique applicate technique lines or sparring. You want to guide them through it in such a way that they're going to get through it and develop because your your job is to give them the confidence and and the and the right spirit if you don't it's like going into we say in a soccer match you get a ball in the face in the first game you know or you get on a horse and you fall off the horse the first lesson you're not coming back to it so you first thing is analyze what kind of person you're facing with and the challenge for all instructors is to develop that person whether it's to tune in something is to help them with self-control if they're too aggressive you know help them to have a little bit of aggression if they're too passive build confidence build ability and make sure that they you know i think ed parker i think in his advertisement for you know for intros said if you do a yellow bell course the material that you have will be useful you can use you can defend yourself with the yellow belt material you don't have to wait till your black belt and really it, it's it's all instructors should be thinking that as they train their students that they have this ability to be able to become relatively competent as early as possible so that the the art that we teach them is 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 a useful and obviously we don't want to get into conflict but if they did they have a reasonable chance of defending themselves two parts you're the international director of the advanced Kempo training system. Explain yeah. what that position is. And second of all, how do you motivate, inspire the advanced instructors under you to help their students? Okay. Well, in, I have, I see most, most of, in Ireland, most of my guys will train with me at least weekly or if not monthly. So they all will travel to travel to my studio. The Europeans are pretty similar. We have like clubs in France and Austria and all over Europe and they, they'll fly into us. So 
it is a little bit like continental US. So if you have someone really far away in New York and they fly to California, they do that. And they'll do that maybe two, three times a year and then maybe they'll come to a camp as well. So I, I get to, like we had a black, one of my younger daughter, Trish, um, tested for a black belt last year. So the testing panel was Bob White, John Sepulveda, Ben Ukitas. You know, we had, we, had a great, we had a great panel. But I took those black belts together. We had 12 weeks of training. And I effectively probably ran the black belt test 10 times. They did it again and again and again. And we drilled and drilled and drilled and we did techniques and we fought until my approach was that it wasn't looking for the weakest link. It was to really to build unity among everybody so that the guys who are maybe a little bit weaker, they got stronger. And the guys who were stronger and maybe they, they pulled everyone up. And rather than go out and start look at the initial group and say, hey, I don't like to look at that form or that technique. We didn't do that. We just, we just start training and start working. And it was like, I suppose, if you look at some of these Marine movies where you get the 20 guys in and eventually at the end of it, when the parade comes out, those 20 guys are moving together, training together, looking strong together. And that was my, that's my approach. So we have regular black belt classes. We have regular camps and everyone trains. I mean, for the moment, I mean, I, I have, you know, I don't have disaffections. People who are black belts of me, if they got their black belt 20, 30 years ago, they're still my students. They're still training with me. I don't, we don't have um, people moving off to different associations. We're still very much a very unified group. And we have, we, because we, we're good family, we're good friends. So we, we train hard together and we treat everyone with respect. So everyone really is a family member really. And they don't, as I say, we don't lose people. We, we regularly gain people, but we never lose them. Your proudest accomplishment as a teacher. My daughter is getting her black belts. That's, <laughs> I'm so happy. Um, when Mr. Parker, had my older daughter, she was born in 1990. She was born in February, 1990. And uh, Mr. Parker was teaching us in March of that year. And um, he was holding Ashling in his arms. And, and, and actually his joke to me was, he said, uh, so what happened, Edward? He said, did you, did you share the same glass of water? So that was his, uh, that was his joke to me. But he, um, when the seminar was on, uh, my wife was training. Um, so she was training and he, uh, Leanne Parker was holding Ashling. She, you know, so in some ways, um, that memory of, um, of, um, Ed Parker holding my daughter and because she was born in 1990, her, her birthday will always reflect the passing of Ed Parker. So if she's 30 years old, 30 years old now, she'll always reflect, but to see those, and the thing for my daughter is getting their black belts. They got their black belts with everybody. They trained, they were in with, with the guys, training hard with the guys, with, with a really big international panel. They, they were not given it, they earned it. And they, helped, they got the respect of everybody else. And I suppose, um, you know, I have a good school. Hopefully, <laughs> we're, uh, with the COVID thing and the virus thing, we're back open next week. And we we'll probably have some limitations how we can operate, but um, we have a great school. I mean, I, I think someone did a calculation with all the, all our combined clubs. We have about if all, if all the students in the clubs in Ireland. We have about three thousand campusists in my in the schools affiliated with us, which is a great bunch, which is a great group of clubs. So um, I'm very proud of what all the black all our black belts have done, and um, hope. Hopefully, uh, the, we'll have great success for the future because um, we serve. It, it's going to be a challenge the next few weeks, but I'm sure this this pandemic will pass, and uh, we'll will be a, we'll come out we'll, we'll get stronger on the, on the other side of it. You've studied with several people, and you are associated with John Sepulveda. Yes, as we both know. What have you learned from Mr. Sepulveda? Well, he's very much a technician. He's strong. He's articulate. Um, what I like about him is that he's very, I mean, he's very precise. You get you he, he get very detailed instructor. 
Um, he's, his ability to pass on information is good. Plus, as a person, he shows great skill and empathy with all students. So he'll treat a white belt and you know, a fifth degree black belt exactly the same. He'll give time to everybody. And he has been, he said he's been strict and set a high standard for us, but he's also been very generous with his time and a good, a good role model for everybody. I mean, it's very important for me to have the people that I teach, that for me to be a role model and the people that I have as role models are people that I can say, here's my teacher. And people can say, I can see why that man's your teacher because he has some great qualities. Does he focus mostly on techniques or forms or freestyle or just an overview? He, he's just an overview. I mean, he cover, he'll work on basics. He'll work on fighting. He'll work on, he'll work on everything. I mean, he won't, uh, sometimes he'll, you know, he'll, he'll spend, you know, a seminar, one technique and he'll want that technique. To, he'll want every app, app like part of that technique to, you know, defined and explained and detailed and, and he and it'll be enjoyable. I mean, it may seem like one technique, but the detail and the, he'll draw the he'll draw you out. But the good thing is, everybody in that seminar will walk out with a really good skill set, whatever whether it's a sparring technique or a form or a, or tech or self defense. They'll have a skill to go with it. Okay, uh, have you uh, <clears throat> have you ever looked at obviously American Campbell and Compers? many, many facets and we've discussed so far. Have you ever looked outside of American Kempo for influence? Have you, you know, practiced or trained with any other uh, style? Have you involved yourself with weapons? I mean, I, in terms of, I, I've been very curious about every style. I mean, I just, during the pandemic, I was clearing out my, my attic and uh, I think I threw out a couple of thousand black belt magazines because I had been collecting them for the last 40 years. Now, obviously, I mean, with Ed Parker in it, I kept. But, I mean, I educated myself with other arts. I've been to many camps where I would be studying with other, other styles. So, the, so if you were a lot of jiu-jitsu, we would be lucky, we'd be training with. So we go to, a, a, you know, a, they, we teach Kempo and then they teach jiu-jitsu. And we'd go and learn jiu-jitsu. Same for Shotokan. And so we, we had these multi-style camps where, after we did our um, tempo, then we participate in their style. So I've seen, studied a lot with, you know, you know, different types of martial arts. Um, I've never sought rank, but I have a good knowledge base. I mean, in my, I, I sometimes used to define tempo as the anti-style style. So, I mean, Ed Parker would say to us, like, you know, if a judo guy does this, this is what you do. If a jiu-jitsu guy does this, is what you do. So in order to be have a competency against other styles, you need to understand everything about them. So that background of going to seminars and training with other people and seeing what their tactics were, I like that. When I was, um, my vocation before I became a full, I've been teaching Kempo full-time now for 35 years as a professional. But prior to that, I was a chef, but I was also a specialist. I used to teach um, butchery at a, at a butcher. And I, I had a knife in my hand, maybe eight, 10 hours a day cutting all the time. So I had have a pretty good knowledge of how to use a knife. And so when people would talk about knife techniques, I mean, I remember one teacher, he was teaching a technique where, and very competent and showing the move, and this is what you do. And he was a very high ranking, and very popular teacher. And I said to him, you, know, you really can't do that because what he was doing was in because I train people how to cut to cut, he would have he would have gutted himself because the reality was you couldn't use them. In reality, the knife could not have been used the way he was using it. You know, it would have it would have he would have impaled himself. But in an abstract way, the move looked pretty impressive. But in reality, it wasn't it wasn't safe because I knew if you've got a knife in your hand all the time and you're cutting and you're working against flesh and bone and tendon. You know, you'll, you'll, under, you'll know pretty quickly how that weapon will work. So sometimes when I watch people using it or, or being very expert in it, and really they, have a, and they don't have the knowledge of how to use it. We've, in the last couple of weeks, we've had conversations with people that have spent a considerable amount of time with knife training. Uh, 
And, and my question for you is this, the basic Kempo weapons defenses, obviously you probably review those, share those with your students. Have you expanded on that? Have you looked to uh, develop it? Have you minimized it? Uh, I mean, we haven't seen any development in, in over 30 years since Mr. Parker's passing. And most people just hold true to these, these techniques. And that's the first part. And the second thing I'm gonna ask you about ground the game on dealing with being on the ground. So let's go with, first of all, how do you deal with weapons as taught by Kempo? The, the, the issue you have with, with knives is that really you, you don't want, you should never want to engage. I mean, first thing I do with a, I mean, with a knife is, um, I'll, I'll, we use the wooden training ones initially and I'll just go to, I'll show a person that it's impossible. If you start pumping it at somebody and you're going to, you're going to show them how easy it is to be stabbed. So in reality, defending against a knife is, it's almost impossible. So really it's, you know, I call, I call most of, most of the tech Kempo techniques are I call whole shit techniques in that it's a late C and you just try to, you're, you're, you're doing a, you're doing something just to save yourself and get the hell out of there. There's no, trying to engage a knife that you don't have to engage is suicide. I mean, it's like trying to go, it's like trying to win in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is full of losers. Wait a second. So uh, Hold on there, pal. <laughs> I know a lot of guys yeah. living in Vegas. Uh, I'm one of them, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, yeah. You're so, talking about the gambling community, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. thank you. I just want to qualify that. I'll still, yeah, be, yeah. I'll still take you to the local pub and you can tell me if it's good or bad. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I mean, we look at the Kempo techniques, but I always tell my students, you've got to run. I mean, you've got to run, you've got to whatever. I mean, I, I watch where, you know, the, the thing about it, one of the things I, I've taught in seminars, and I can leave some videos where they're, I, you should always wear a, a belt, a belt around your waist. And I would have that belt off in about one second. And it's a, a long belt where you have a belt buckle. And, you know, I, we do it sometimes in a seminar, we get the karate belt off. And I give the guy a knife and I basically whip him, you know, and he's in a bad way because distance is your best friend. And that's the lesson. I mean, if you see a knife and it's not in your gut or in your head or in your neck, what are you doing? You should not engage. That's the lesson. So rather than learn more techniques, unarmed against a knife is stupid. And if you're trying to learn more unarmed against a knife, it is completely stupid. Your lesson will be run, get out of there, get something, a table, a chair, a snooker cue, a belt, and have, create some sort of an advantage. But if the knife is not in you, then you have a chance. The idea that you should engage with a knife is just crazy. It's, it's, um, you're, you're really risking your life. It's crazy. You shouldn't be doing it. As you know, <clears throat> there's been a great popularity in uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And yeah. we've seen that, that interest uh, run over to, um, um, you know, the common right now, it seems to be the flavor of the month. Nothing disrespectful. Parker came from a ground system at one point in his life. He addressed it. What are your thoughts about jiu-jitsu I, and use with Kempo? I think you have to have a knowledge and I think, I think realistically you have to have a knowledge. You have to have, you have to understand. I think Kempo's approach is if Ed Parker was alive, I think his approach would be something like this. He would look at the fundamentals I and mean, maybe we'd have an anti grappling set or whatever, but everything, everything that you specialize in, if you look, like we talked a moment about knives. If you're a knife fighter, you just want to do knives. If you're a kicker, you just want to kick. If you're a grappler, you just want to grapple. So if you over specialize in something that you want to do it to a certain extent, I think a lot of times I, I look at, I look at the streets, I look, I talk to policemen, I talk to prison officers, you know, in the real world, a lot of people don't go to the ground. And part of the issue is, is that, you know, real, real, real weapons are not uh, you know, chopped to the windpipe and poked to the eye. A lot of times in the grappling scenarios, the weapons that would stop a person in their tracks, we can't use. 
So grappling is kind of, I mean, if, if it was fight to the death and there was no limitation on strikes, a lot of fights that have, you know, the, the, the UFC type of fights, the people would be dying. You know, that's not acceptable. But grappling will always win because the, the, strike, the, the, the strike that will work, because if you look at how karate developed, karate developed because you had to have lethal strikes to areas where, where, where und, un, undefendable. But I think you need, I think, I think almost all my students have looked at grappling. I mean, I've looked at grappling. Um, but it's like, um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like watching UFC in recent times. There are people now who are able to counter the grapplers. Obviously, every fight is unique to people. You could make, you could put a grappler against a striker, but you put in a weak grappler and a good striker, or you put a weak striker and a good grappler. So it's like a horse race. It really depends on what you're facing. So grappling is definitely, um, it, it's a Pandora's box. We need to face it. But at the same time, it's really down to two people. Who those two people are on the, on, you're facing. And it doesn't mean that every grappler will beat every campist or, or striker. And it doesn't mean every striker will beat every grappling. It doesn't work like it. It's the two people fighting, in my opinion. Do you incorporate any grappling in your in your teachings? I don't, but my students do. Why? Well, the reason I mean, from my my perspective, I think I had when I was a young kid, I got crush bones in my neck. You know, they don't bother me, so I don't want to. I don't want to have someone wrapping around my neck and pulling my neck. So I don't want to grapple. Um, plus, I'm a big guy. It's going to be tricky to get me down. But I'm sure to. to I mean. I was in Australia teaching seminars and the guy said, you know that saying, the bigger they are, the harder they hit, or the harder they fall? Well, actually, it's the harder they hit. So in reality, um, you know, for me, I know I, I've learned a lot of, I, mean, I've, I have studied grappling in a sense where I know all the basic holes, but I wouldn't consider myself competent in it. But I'm interested enough to have enough information to save myself and to stay in my where I want to be, I want to be I want to be stand up if I can be. But if I go down, I will I will be able to fight. But I want to get back up as soon as I can. What's the distinction between a grappler and a striker then? I think with a, a grappler is a person who just wants to go to the ground, who wants to engage. A striker is a person who really wants to hit and, and punch and, and stay out a little bit out of it, you know. If you look at the four stages of range, I mean, out of contact, in contact, contact penetration, contact manipulation. I think Kempo is, is really the, designed to be at number three, to be at contract penetration. That's where we are good. And some ways, when the guys penetrate us and they grab onto us and they want to put us down, then we learn how to get the back off into, into back to our favorite position. You know, we think long kimono, twin kimono, all those type of techniques which Destructive twins, or when the guy latches on, but look, grappling is a new technology. We need to study it. We need to have a. We need to have solutions. And I mean, I've studied enough so that I'm understanding it. But I'm a beginner. I need to. I have so much more to learn. Don't you think, Mr. Parker, yeah. addressed those issues in the when he developed American Kempo? I think he did. I think the solutions are in American Kempo. But we got to look at, you know, it's, it's more like um, we need to keep looking. I mean, like I said earlier, we're, we're not, I mean, Kempo is, is an, uh, we are evolving. We look at the new, I mean, we look at what's coming out. I mean, at the moment it's grappling. There could be something different in, a, in a, another few years. I mean, we just have to look at every fad or every phase that come, comes through. I mean, for a time, Aikido was a, was a, was a fad, um, you know, it was um, Crab Magra was a fad. They're all fads that come true. And in a way, Kempo is the ultimate mixed martial art. It's because it's so well blended and we have the tools to adjust. We can see what the, what the challenge is and we can adjust. I'm, I, I'm a Kempoist and I will always be a Kempoist. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. That's good. So what we're going to do now is we're going to ask our uh, participants that are watching to uh, ask a few questions uh, to Master of the Arts, Ed Downey. 
And I'm going to go right down the list and introduce some of these people. So your microphones should come on off. And when I introduce you and you can ask him a question. So we'll start with a few people going right off the bat. Mr. Sullivan, right. say right. hello to Master Downey. Master Downey, how are you, my friend? I am great, sir. It's great to hear your voice. It's great to see you, my friend. We've been on the road for the last hour, and so I missed the show. I'm going to have to watch it on a rerun. But I do have a question for you, Ed. Back in the, uh, back in the day, yes, before, before Mr. Parker died, uh, I don't recall any IKKA uh, techniques that involved a headbutt, a deliberate headbutt. Do you? Well, the, the, we, the, you know, you do fatal cross. Um, with fatal cross, we were told that when you did short form three, you did the backward headbutt in, in the, for scraping hoof. And then potentially in fatal cross, because your hands were low, you could have a headbutt on the front side with uh, fatal cross. So, you know. Uh, it was um, there, but but not uh, not very um, prominent. Not very well known, not for, no, no. I wouldn't say it was. But, but I, know the, I, know the, I know the Brits and the Irish are, are, are really big on headbutts. That's a hell of a weapon. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely it, it, love it. it. it, it. It, it is, yeah. We used to um, we used to have a saying in Ireland, you know, we'd say, can you stitch? And then you say, and then the answer, they'd answer yes. And then you'd say, well, stitch this, boom. And then there's the head <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. It is, it's a tremendous weapon and it was just largely ignored. Well, we put it in, I mean, as soon as I discovered it, it was like, are you kidding me? I mean, this close, I don't know, I don't know smashing his nose across his face with my head with my forehead oh my god mm -hmm. and the back of the head somebody grabs you from behind the very first thing we do is we smash it with our head and that's, yeah. that's the first thing that happens oh, oh it's, 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 a, it's a it's a dirt it's a weapon it's not something you, you you'll you'll be in trouble if you get one of those <laughs> oh yes you are i got some stories about that anyhow thank you so much my friend thank, thank you, you sir we appreciate that you have a great day and happy Thank Father's you, Day to you. Let's you move on over here to Chuck from Chandler. Chuck, are you there? Why don't you say hello to Master yeah. Downey? Hello. Master Downey. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your Irish humor and diplomacy. Uh, for those that don't know, the uh, Irish diplomacy is when you tell somebody to go to hell and have them look forward to the trip. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just happened to think of something on the, on the uh, grappling defenses. I wonder uh, you know, what is when the people train in grappling, are there certain rules? Are there things that they can't do, something that they're not taught that we can use to advantage in defending against grapplers? I think that, I mean, you have to re respect that they've that they have a good technology. I mean, they have they have a technology. I think the problem is with with us with where we won't want to hit people is we can't. It's like having a gun, and if you can shoot a guy dead, you said, "Look, there he is, he's dead." But in reality, none of the, the strikes that will the strikes that are going to be efficient against a grappler we can't illustrate because. I mean, he, he can't kill a guy, so it's kind of a catch twenty two scenario that, that the grappler will he can he can show full potential of his of his skill set where we we have to limit what we can do. We can we have to take out probably the, the, you know the eye pokes, the windpipe strikes, the you know spinal hits, you know maybe side kicks to the knee. There's so many things that would be useful to stop them. I mean, you get a kick in the kneecap and a side kick or you know, a lot of things that would be very, very bad for them, we can't do. And you wouldn't want to do, but, it would, but in the real world and when you were fighting for your life, you'd have to, you would do it and that would change it. So it's difficult because they can illustrate the full range of their potential where we really can't show what, what's possible because it's not safe as such. Thank you, Chuck. We appreciate your, uh, your question and spending... Uh, this moment's with Mr. Downey. Let's go over here to, uh, let's go over to Steve Orsino. Mr. Orsino, are you there? 
Do you take time off from the beach? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Ed, how you doing? It's good to see you. Just kind of curious. Um, uh, you know, we had the 32 techniques for belt. That was all fun. Um, do you teach? The, you still maintain 32, or do you teach a different variation? And no, we're we're on the nowadays. We go the 16, 20 syllabus. So it's um, we do the ba basically the way that works. It's the base curriculum to black belt. So everything up to long four, two man form, bow form, all the base techniques, and then we hit the extensions from uh, second degree up, and then we do long five. We do we do long five, we do long six, we do long seven, and we I have my own version of long eight, which I basically completely re-engineered because I didn't like what I seen. But uh, we we do the curri the full curriculum, but we found I. A lot of our, we, we like the idea of the base curriculum to black belt. I think the base, all the base techniques, um, that's good. Very good. Good. good Anything else, Stephen? I'm good. That's it. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on board. Let's go to Greg Hildebrand. Greg, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. My, my, my camera's a bit sketchy, though. So. That's all right. Go ahead and say hello to Master Downey. Uh, Mr. Danny, how are you doing, sir? It's the first time I've actually really met you, so it's a pleasure to meet you and be, be part of this and be able to uh, participate and uh, actually just sit back and listen to you and your stories and your outlook, your viewpoints. I find that I, I find that I'm, I, I find that I'm akin to your viewpoints and your experiences, especially with weapons and especially knives. So, but I'm just grateful to be here. I have no questions. Just thank you for letting me participate, be a part of this, Mr. Casey and Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Well, Downey. Well, well, hopefully at some point, Greg, we can meet in the future, either either in the U.S. or in Ireland, wherever. If you make it to Ireland, you'll, be, you'll, you'll get a great welcome. Or if not, if we see each other, hopefully I can see you sometime in the U.S. as well. Uh, I look forward to that. Thank you, sir. Just want to make sure I get everybody a chance. How about Lorenzo? Hey, Lorenzo, how you doing, sir? Can you say hello to Master Downey? Hello, everybody. Hello, Mr. Lowry. Hello. hello. Uh, it's the first time that I speak uh, I this with you. For me, it's a pleasure to speak with you. I have some questions because uh, you are you live in Europe. And um, who is your opinion uh, about the Kempo in Europe now? Well, we have a great Kempo. We have, I mean, Kempo in Europe is, 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 is as good as anywhere in the world. I mean... Are you based in Spain? Yes. Are you in Spain? Yes. I live are in you, Barcelona. You're, are you, is your, Lorenzo, is your club in Spain at the moment? Yes, I live in Barcelona. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, well, I, I mean, I've seen, I, I, I've been, I go to the guys in Malaga, Eduardo de la Torre. They're very good. Anybody I've seen that's good, strong, standard. There's a few different groups out there around Europe. I mean, European Kempo is some of the best in the world. I mean, uh, I think uh, I like a lot. I, I think I've seen some of your, your work, Lorenzo, and I think you're looks like you're doing a very good job in Barcelona. And uh, it, hopefully I'd like to see, meet or see you in the future as well. Uh, uh, we will talk uh, for the possibility to come to Barcelona someday to do some, uh, some pitching in my, in my club, okay? So we will in contact, okay, yeah, Mr. Downey? That would be a great honor, and that would be a great honor. Uh, uh, Paul, thank you so much for this conversation okay. because uh, this is a, a good opportunity to talk about thank about uh, as uh, as Downey. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Downey. Uh, we will in contact uh, uh, to come to Barcelona, okay? Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Well, you know, at this point, we're going to close it out. Any closing thoughts there, Mr. Downey? Future of Kempo. It's just great to see. Well, I think if, uh, if I, it's just great. Kempo is just alive. It's strong. It's great to see everyone um, still. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, I love him. Uh, it's great. He's, I just want to, whatever he's taken, if he's, if he's adding secret recipe, it, to have the energy and the spirit. I need to find it. He's a fantastic man.
Yes, this is Paul Casey with the Kimball Karate Hall of Fame with our special guest, Master Ed Downey, all the way from Ireland. God bless you, sir. Everybody have a great weekend, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Take care. Take care. Take care.